Hello everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Easter. I have a lot of questions that I want to answer. Um, so I'm just going to go right through them. Today is basic Sunday, basic risk, uh, TFCC Sunday. We're going to go over some basic things. First is um, one size fits all. I actually have two sizes, um, but um, the, the average circumference of the human wrist is five and a half to eight and a half inches. And so the wrist widget is designed to fit um, all that, that range. There are some people that fall on either ends and we have some solutions for that. But I have two versions. I have a narrow version, which is the one that you get when you order. And over the course of 15 years, I've figured out that this works better for a wider range. There's actually more people with small wrists than there are large wrists. I have two sizes and they look identical, but they're not. This one is a wide and this one's for um, large, large, larger people. And it's because the distance between the distal ulna and the distal wrist crease is a little bit wider. Um, some people say that this slips. It's a very small percentage of people that have an anatomical variation in their ulnar head. Their ulnar head is just a little bit smaller and so it just tends to slide over it. Um, and the question was, why shouldn't the brace go over the ulna head? And this is a very important component to the wrist widget. It's because when you push down on the ulna head, you're stressing that 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 uh, triangular cartilage, which is in the shape of a triangle. And when you push on the ulna head, you're pushing down on one side of it. And if the 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 ligament is strained, then it will hurt. So you don't want any compression on the ulna head, which is really important actually if you do have any sort of splinting. Um, most splints and casts, they tend to push down on the ulna head and that actually causes a lot of pain and discomfort. And if you have that, you want to change it right away. You don't want to wait um, if you're in a cast. You want to have that cast removed and get that compression off of the ulna head. It is technically really hard to cast the wrist without putting pressure on the ulna head and very few can do it just right. So um, if you're putting the cast on after surgery and you have a, a swelling, that's fine, but once the swelling goes down, if that compression to the ulna head is there, it'll really hurt. Okay. Um, how do you put it on? It's uh, really simple. You want to be able to just put nothing on that ulna head. And this can be there. It can be all the way over here. You can turn it around and wear it the other way as well. Um, so, you know, I wanted it, I, it's really hard, a lot of splints to have small, medium, large, extra large, extra small, and right and left. And so it was important to me that I created something that fit, fit both right and left side. So this is one way where you pull it back. And then the other way is to turn it around. And pull it this way. Now, if you really have a small wrist, you'll get to the end of this U. So you'll pull it, you pull it all the way down to this U. It's a kid's wrist. And you can cut these off and pull this back and cut this and get it so that it, it goes all the way around. But you don't, don't need to, but if you want to get rid of this extra stuff, it's easy to do. All right, how do you care for it? Um, these dry very fast. And so you can just put this in a, a, a bowl of vinegar and water, a tablespoon of vinegar with a couple cups of water. Just soak it for about 10 minutes and then let it hang dry. You don't want to put it in the wash. Um, you know, you want to just try to keep the friction off of it when you're washing it. So I like just to throw it in a bowl with some vinegar water or some lemon in it. All right, how tight should it be? The wrist widget is designed to tolerate 140 pounds of load. So when somebody is loading the wrist at 140 pounds, a Velcro hold is going to hold that there. And so what um, you'll find is that it, you're gonna need it tighter when you're doing heavier things. So if you have a complete tear, you're gonna, you're gonna see that your weight bearing goes down really quickly, very far. So let's say you're 100 pounds and you're uninjured wrist and your weight bearing is down at 20. When you put the wrist widget on, you're gonna need 100 pounds of force to function. So in complete tears, you need a lot more tension. Um, in somebody that's doing construction work, you're gonna need a lot, there's a lot more torque and tension, so you're gonna have to tighten it up. 
but in general, it should just be snug. And what you want to think of is a wound. So if you've got your skin and you've got a cut in your skin and they put stitches through it, what, what that's doing is just keeping the pieces together. And if you have a complete tear, your wrist spreads and you're going to need a lot of force to keep it together. If you have a mild tear, then you're just going to need a little bit of force. So you want to adjust it based on your injury and you want to adjust it based on your load. Um, do you wear it at night? It took thousands of cases for me to articulate a protocol. At first, I didn't really know what the protocol was going to be. How long it, did it take to heal? What Do you wear it at night? Can you return to work? Can you return to load? And it took me a really long time to articulate a protocol. And the nighttime use is for anybody that... If with and without this, your weight bearing is under 60 pounds, you want to wear it at night, all night. And again, it's to keep, it's like a stitch, it's to keep the two bones together. Will it help with ECU and FCU? Um, ECU tendonitis is often related to a primary TFCC tear. And in that case, it's really helpful because it squeezes the radius and ulna together and puts less, relaxes the tension onto the ECU. And um, what I've found is that once that tension is alleviated, the, the ECU stops to bark, stops barking. And that happens at about 45 to 50 pounds. So if your stability is under 40 pounds or 45 pounds, your ECU is going to be barking a lot louder get your stability back and the ECU kind of returns to normal functioning. Um, bicep curls. Uh, this has been a topic this week is why not to do bicep curls, why that's the last thing to come, and why it the radius and the bicep influence the TFCC. All right, the bicep is a very strong flexor. There's a couple of reasons the bicep get tight. First is, if you have this injury, you're gonna automatically be bending your elbow to protect your wrist. So the bicep gets tight just from being bent. And the elbow is one of the stiffest joints in the body. It doesn't like to be, it, it stiffens up very, very quickly. And so that bicep gets tight, and then the pronator gets tight. And the pronator, it, when your hurt, wrist hurts, you're not gonna be putting your arm out with your wrist palm up. You're gonna be here, pronated with the elbow bent. So the pronator and the bicep get very tight. And to, to change that, you have to first get stability because then your mind's not going to be worried about it so much and you're not going to be protecting that arm so much. Second is you've got to stretch the bicep and the pronator. And the bicep stretches um, I, are on the, there's a combo bicep stretch on the website. It's the pronator stretch. And then you got to strengthen the tricep, got to strengthen the tricep. And the tricep strength really does change um, the pull. If you strengthen the bicep, the tricep, the bicep turns off. So it's really important to do some tricep strengthening. Um, and uh, we've got some videos on how to do that tricep. Most people want to do this. I don't recommend that um, till the TFCC is healed. I go in a wrist in neutral pronate and supination lying on the ground with the elbow straight. Okay, some other questions. Uh, when can I work out? Again, that took a really long time to figure out. Um, how? What do you tell people when they say, when can I return to work full load? Or when can I play tennis again? Or when can I golf? You need 65 pounds of grip strength of uh, uh, weight bearing tolerance before you can load the rest. Period, plain and simple. Um, it's just that's the number, and um, there are things once you get there. 65. If your normal weight bearing is 120 pounds, 65 is half of your load tolerance. Um, so, although you can work out, you're still 50% of normal. So there are some things you can do to strengthen and get ready for return to heavy load. Um, but in general, 65 pounds is your magic number for returning to load. Um, all right, hold on, I've got more questions. Um, is conservative pronated quadratus and ECU strengthening okay? No. No, I don't strengthen the pronator because that often gets tight. I strengthen the supinator, if anything, and I don't ever do any ECU strengthening, and that's just because the ECU 
Um, the mechanics of the ECU change with the TFCC tear and strengthening of the ECU will make things worse. And again, that took a long time to articulate. So I don't do any strengthening of the ECU. Um, why does the MRI say I have a tear, but, but then it ends up being dis misdiagnosed? Um, the, the, the thing, the fuel, the fuel that keeps me working is the regular MRI results that come out um, false positive or false negative. We have to do better as a medical community in identifying this injury early and having a reliable, a reliable tool, tool. And the MRI is simply just not that. There are better MRIs than others. Open MRIs aren't as reliable. T3, Tesla, Tesla 3 MRI is more reliable, but still they come out all too often inconsistent with symptoms. And um, the, that's a big deal for me to say that, um, that I don't like MRIs because that's the gold standard. Even arthrograms aren't that great. I use MRIs plus clinical evaluation and the weight bearing test is far more accurate. Okay, um, can a complete tear, tear heal conservatively? Absolutely yes, absolutely yes, absolutely yes. And central and peripheral tears and their healing ability. Central tears heal even though they are avascular. There are new research that shows that they do get circulation and I can say that central tears heal. Um, they take longer. Uh, they behave differently. The last, the central tears don't like bicep curls as much as peripheral tears. Peripheral tears, um, you can move through biceps a lot faster than central tears and um, that's a rotational biomechanical thing. Um, peripheral tears heal faster. Um, they're more progressive. Um, they have more blood supply and they just heal faster. How long does it take to t a TFCC to heal? Um, most people do not have the endurance to um, conservatively manage this. And this is important. It takes three months. It takes three months for this to get better. And it takes regular daily management. And um, uh, surgery takes a year of healing. And so you have a choice, three months or a year. And either way, you have to put the work in. And the work is largely knowing what to do and when to do it. So uh, uh, what, what do you wear? What are your signs and symptoms? How do you treat each one of them? And that's our objective here, is to educate people on what to do, and how long it's gonna be and what it entails. Uh, let's see. Should I do the ulnar short shortening surgery since nothing else is helping? All right, there are some landmarks where surgery is valuable. Um, somebody that has had ulnar sided wrist pain that's not related to any autoimmune or inflammatory systemic issue. They've had a fall or an injury and um, they, it's gone untreated or it's treated conservatively without any objective improvement. Those landmarks are if, you're got, if you have weight bearing tolerance under 20 pounds and on a weekly basis you don't see the weight bearing improve, it doesn't go from 20 to, to 30 to 40 to 50, there's no improvement on a weekly basis and you'll be able to tell relatively quickly. Those cases are um, important to consider surgery in, and only in those cases. And the reason is because there's a cascading of events that happen that are detrimental to the function of the wrist. And the longer you wait to go untreated, the higher incidence you have of ECU tendonitis, scapholunate problem, lunotriquetral injuries, and the dynamics or kinematics of the wrist change so much that it affects long-term outcomes. So let me repeat that again. If your weight bearing is under 20 pounds, and you don't show objective changes in your weight bearing numbers on a weekly basis, then surgery should be considered. But really, once you get to 45, you're kind of out of the woods. You're, you're functional and you can get this better. And that's a large majority of people. Um, uh, it does, it does, uh, uh, okay, so my TFCC injury is relatively, is healing slowly. They do heal slowly. Um, but pain is getting worse on the side of the ulna head. Um, 
the idea that the bone has shifted sounds pretty serious. Okay, to, for it to be so prominent. Okay, a prominent um, uh, ulna head is not prevalent in everybody that has a TFCC tear. It's just not. It is the prominent ulna head um, doesn't also correlate to weight bearing, which means you could have 130 pounds of weight bearing tolerance and have an elevated ulna head. Also, an elevated ulna head is not easy to re to measure, so there's no objective tool to measure height. You could do some some comparisons of pictures, which I've tried, but they're really hard to get right. And so, it, in that environment, it's difficult to measure outcome of treatment. A prominent ulna head, in my opinion, has to do with the nerve and the radial nerve specifically. Um, probably the ulna nerve as well. Um, and, and those are difficult to measure as well. So the, um, the, the, the usually the prominent ulna head has more to do with alignment of the elbow than it does the alignment of the uh, proximal row of the wrist and the distal radius and the ulna. So I always look at the elbow and the nerve when dealing with a prominent ulna head. Um, does it, I don't see any correlation between grip strength and an elevated ulna head, meaning that grip strength, you can get full grip strength back and still have an elevated ulna head. I don't see a difference in range of motion of the wrist. Um, I do see some radial head um, rotational issues at the elbow. I also see a uh, impingement of the um, radial nerve at the elbow that, as it goes to the wrist that contribute to an elevated on the head. So yeah, I'd, I'd, if you have an elevated on the head, please send pictures and um, send me your some information about you and maybe we can collect some more data on this. I've been collecting data on the elevated on the heads for a long time. And I've gotten really um, just some suggestions of cause, but not really consistent um, causes. But it's not, it's not always present in people with have, that have TFCC tears. All right, so I have here, um, uh, send me some of your, oh, we got questions here. Ah, uh, yeah, can an untreated hammy fracture be interfering with TFCC tears? Hi, Island Daisy. An untreated hamate fracture is something I see all too often. It does affect weight bearing tolerance and it does cause ulnar sided wrist pain. Um, most of the time, it's the hamate that's causing the ulnar sided wrist pain and not the TFCC. And the way I figure that out is that you have no change in weight bearing tolerance with the wrist widget on. And the other thing is that I don't do the weight-bearing test with an extended palm. I have the palm in a gripped position, either over the edge of the scale or on a dowel. So you, we've put some videos up, but basically on a dowel. So it takes the extension of the ring and the, the small finger out of the weight-bearing tolerance. <coughs> um, Hamate fractures, uh, they're just... Yeah, an untreated hamate fracture is a whole nother discussion on its own. The most important thing for hamate fractures to me is that you splint the wrist in this position. Wrist is about 30 degrees of extension. IPs are down, IPs are straight, MPs are at 60 degrees, and you hold that for four weeks. That should calm everything down here. Um, and you can add a little bit of a strap on that splint to give a support to the distal radius and ulna, but resting those is key and it doesn't take long, they heal really fast, and then once you do come out of that splint, you've gotta do some stretching exercises. The fingers and the nerve that go underneath the hamate need to be mobilized smoothly, um, gently, and regularly. All right, I had a test just positive for T, however, no fall or injury, probably no tear. Um, okay, so, hold on. So, okay, so people, we're going to be talking about that this week. Um, there is a small subset of people, about 18% of 
of the people that cut, that develop TFCC tears have absolutely no injury or fall. And this group of people is intriguing to me. Um, their weight bearing goes down quite a bit for no reason, for no reason at all. And this group of people, um, they, uh, I ran a little study, I'll talk about this further this week, on the uh, health of their gut. And I have found that there's a correlation between pathology in the gut. And pathology is a is just a word to say something's off. And that could be bacterial infection, uh, virus, the flu, stomach flu, um, uh, H. pylori, parasites, Lyme. It could be a large list, long list of things that are going on in the stomach. And when treated, their ulnar sided wrist pain goes away. So um, we're going to be talking about that just this week, so stay tuned. Um, we'll be doing some posts every day about the stomach, but that's speaking to that 18% of people that just wake up one day and their ulnar side of the wrist is on fire. Um, okay, I put on a voodoo floss relatively tight, which provides me with complete comfort and support. Do you think during the interim with the muscle floss I can resume normal weightlifting? Um, um, Mr. Inspirational. Okay, the flossing <clears throat> and muscle, nerve, nerve and muscle lengthening. Um, after this week of talking about the stomach, we're going to be going into nerve. And the nerve is important um, because uh, oftentimes we have nerve the nerve, the radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, the median nerve, typically the radial and the ulnar nerve gets pinched and it doesn't conduct electricity well and so you develop tightness and weaknesses in the muscles that are root cause is a nerve. Um, the, the nerve gliding is good to do, flossing, it's called flossing. And what it does is essentially takes the nervous system and stretches it and relaxes it and stretches it and relaxes it. Those are good. But restoring the alignment at the elbow and the shoulder and the neck is important because if you're doing the flossing and it helps, great. But there are people that do the flossing and it irritates things because their nerve is getting pinched. So first step is identifying um, where the nerve goes and what are the positions of stretch of that nerve. And then um, identifying if there's a spot that's pinched and then focusing on that spot. I start the spine and then I move out to the shoulder blade, and then I go out to the arm, and then out to the elbow, and then out to the wrist in helping people identify where that nerve is getting pinched. And there's some really cool nerve tension tests that we can do, um, which I'll be showing you, um, so you can help identify where that nerve is getting pinched. Um, the, the, the answer to your question is, can, when can you resume normal activity? First is, what is your weight bearing tolerance? Are you at that 65 pounds of weight bearing tolerance? Second, have you done your tricep strengthening and your pronator and bicep stretches? How's your shoulder strength? So our strengthening series took a long time to articulate because we didn't want to irritate any symptoms. So they're, they're, they're done, they're designed and um, progressed so that you're not irritating the nerve and you're not irritating the TFCC. So I'd go through all of those stretches Make sure you know what you're doing and listen and incorporate them into your daily activities. And then when you get to 65 pounds, you can tolerate a nice tricep lift. It's the same bilaterally. Then you can start working out nice and slow. Okay, let's see. Um, Anna, okay, let's see if I have any more questions. That's a lot to cover. Okay, so this week um, we have the honor of having Dr. Dean with RNA Remag joining us. She wrote The Magnesium Miracle, which has um, been translated into 130 languages and is been kind of the Bible for cardiac doctors. And um, she's, I'm very, very honored that she's going to join us. Her website, rnareset.com, is um, a wonderful place to start if you've got any sort of gut issues. Um, and she's going to talk about the importance of mineral supplements, dehydration, um, 
uh, how to manage candida and irritable bowel syndrome and some of these um, uh, intestinal uh, nutritional perspective and um, she will be joining us on Friday I'm super excited about it so take a look at her website ask any questions articulate any questions that you may have and send them our way and I'll be interviewing her on Friday after that we're gonna do a nerve um, so it's really nice to have your questions beforehand I've got a lot of questions here um, that I'm trying to answer every Sunday um, I think, I think that's it. Anybody else have some questions before I say goodbye? Ah, okay, here we go. If I have ulnar instability only, can I use a wrist widget? Um, well, ulnar instability is a very broad term. Um, there, there are a lot of things that can cause ulnar instability. Lots. Remember, the TFCC, or the ulnar side of the wrist, is considered the black box. There's a lot of structures going through that area, and any problems in a, a wide variety of those will create instability in the wrist. So, ulnar instability is a broad term that can't be answered with just the wrist widget. So, the question is, what is causing the ulnar instability? Is it the TFCC, scapholunate? Was it a wrist fracture, an ulnar fracture, a radial fracture? Is it a cyst? Is it a UT ligament? Is it the ECU? Is it the FCU? There's, is it the ulnar nerve? Let's just go down a lot, long, 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 long list of other things that can cause ulnar instability. The good thing is that you can measure with the tape or the wrist widget to see the influence of that on stability. So if somebody comes in with an ulnar instability, you can measure grip strength, you can measure weight bearing tolerance, you can measure pin strength, and you can see if the wrist widget or non-elastic tape has any influence on that and watch it over the course of time. Um, there's static instability, and dynamic instability, and uh, you want to understand those as well. Um, usually with scapholunate injuries, it's a dynamic instability um, that, yeah, I could go on and on and on about um, the UT and the pisiform and the hamate and the triquetrum <laughs> and the influence of the CMC and uh, uh, just all of it. There's a lot, long list. But you can send over um, Kiro's re Rehabilitacio. Um, you can send over your case if you'd like, and I'd be happy to take a look at it. All right. Um, so just, uh, let's see, I think that's it. Uh, thanks for joining me on Instagram Sunday on Easter, and I hope you all have a wonderful Easter day, and I'll see you next week Friday. Bye.